welcome in the name of Christ. God's grace, mercy and peace be with you all. I know it's lovely to have been asked to lead you in worship again. My name is Canon Tiffa Robinson and I am the Rector of Four Rural Parishes in Suffolk. Today's service is being filmed at St Nicholas Church, Rattleston, and we are looking at Jesus' first miracle, where he turned water into wine at Cana. The grace of God has dawned upon the world through our Saviour, Jesus Christ, who sacrificed himself for us to purify a people as his own. Let us now confess our sins. God, be gracious to us and bless us and make your face shine upon us. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May your ways be known on the earth, your saving power among the nations. Christ, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. You, Lord, have made known your salvation and reveal your justice in the sight of the nations. Lord, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. May Almighty God have mercy upon you, forgive you your sins, and bring you to everlasting life. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, in Christ you make all things new. Transform the poverty of our nature by the riches of your grace. And in the renewal of our lives, make known your heavenly glory. Through Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who is alive and reigns with you, now in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. A reading from the book of the prophet Isaiah. For Zion's sake I will not keep silent, and for Jerusalem's sake I will not rest, until her vindication shines out like the dawn, and her salvation like a burning torch. The nations shall see your vindication, and all the kings your glory, and you shall be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord shall give. You will be a crown of beauty in the hand of the Lord, and a royal diadem in the hand of your God. You shall no more be termed forsaken, and your land shall no more be termed desolate, but you shall be called, My delight is in her, and your land married. For the Lord delights in you, and your land shall be married. For as a young man marries a young woman, so shall your builder marry you. And as the bridegroom rejoices over the bride, so shall your God rejoice over you. This is the word of the Lord.
reading from the Gospel according to John. On the third day, there was a wedding in Cana of Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus and his disciples had also been invited to the wedding. When the wine gave out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what concern is that to you and to me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now, standing there were six stone water jars for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding twenty or thirty gallons. Jesus said to them, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. He said to them, Now draw some out and take it to the chief steward. So they took it. When the steward tasted the water that had become wine, and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew. The steward called the bridegroom and said to him, Everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Jesus did this, the first of his signs, in Cana of Galilee and revealed his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of the Lord. Some people are doing something called dry January, when they abstain from alcohol for the whole month. If you are, I wonder how you're doing by now. I confess I am not, as we continue to celebrate Epiphany, and of course Lent will be here soon enough. Some of you will have given up alcohol many years ago, or never drunk at all, of course. There is something deeply cultural about our relationship with drink. And so when we hear about Jesus turning water into wine, we might have different responses to it, depending on our own experience. This story is a well-known one. So well-known that whenever a priest is at a party which runs out of alcohol, someone will usually refer to it. Jesus is with Mary and the disciples at a wedding feast, and at his mother's prompting, he enables the party to continue by turning huge amounts of water into wine. And not just any wine, but the finest wine. There's a huge amount of symbolism here for us to engage with. The jars filled with water were for the rites of purification, so this could be a symbol of the new covenant of Jesus, in some sense replacing uh, the old requirements of the ceremonial law. There's the slightly odd bit of dialogue between Jesus and Mary, where she is certain this is something that Jesus has to do. And he seems to argue with her about whether this was indeed the right time. Others tend to make much of the fact that Jesus is at a wedding in the first place, as if this somehow bestows particular blessing on marriage in general. At root, though, this is a much simpler story. It's a story about how Jesus takes the dishonour of the wedding party and turns it into the highest honour, without their even knowing that it has happened. You don't have to know much about ancient Israelite weddings to know that running out of wine at the wedding feast would have been a very embarrassing situation indeed, similar to a pub running out of beer on New Year's Eve. This would have cast doubt on the ability of the bridegroom to provide for his family and would have been seen as not a good start to the couple's new life together. Jesus is not present as a magician nor as a great rabbi. He is there as a guest. Only he, Mary, the disciples and the servants know what he has done and he receives no glory and no recognition from the rest of the guests. The steward, upon tasting the new wine, calls the bridegroom and says, everyone serves the good wine first, and then the inferior wine after the guests have become drunk. But you have kept the good wine until now. Honour and praise is heaped upon the bridegroom, 
when he was due dishonour and embarrassment. And this is the key. It's through nothing that he has done at all. Let's not forget, he's failed. He thought he'd get away with half measures, or perhaps he made an error on the shopping order, who knows? But he had failed. And yet here he receives the highest honour for his supposed ability to provide for his guests and his family. This, the first of Jesus' miracles, sets the scene for his ministry. This was not to be a ministry of self-promotion. This was to be a ministry coloured throughout by selfless love and abundance. I mentioned earlier that we might have different responses to this story of Jesus turning water into wine. The problem is human beings cannot cope with abundance. Some, like me, find it hard to stop eating or drinking when there is a lot on offer. Others find abundance distasteful, particularly when there are so many hungry people. The goodness of this world we've been given to steward, we so often squander or hoard because we respond to abundance with either greed or envy. The Bible says that in the new creation, the heavenly Jerusalem, we will buy food and drink without money, as much as we like. And nice though that sounds, it also offends our understandable assumptions about how things are supposed to work. Part of the work God has to do in our lives, this side of the resurrection, is to help us to understand how to cope with the abundance of God, who loves us more than we could ever imagine. Indeed, part of why Christians sometimes fast is to help us to experience God's good gifts to us in a healthy way. It is for abundance that we have been made, and the kingdom Jesus started on earth is one marked by abundance. Jesus' first miracle also made it clear that his ministry would be marked by grace of totally undeserved riches for those who need it the most. Just as he covered the dishonour of the bridegroom at the wedding at Cana, this is the ministry Jesus has amongst us now. We who deserve dishonour for the way we have lived our lives, for the people we have hurt, for the times we have failed God and ourselves, he does not count our sins against us, whether they be big or small. But indeed, instead, through the new wine of his own blood, shed for us on the cross, he has placed us in the place of the highest honour. Christians are not people who are holier than thou. We are those who know that we have messed up and who are astonished that we have not been treated according to our misdeeds, but are instead treated with all the riches the Father has bestowed upon Christ, who has won them for us. We eagerly await the final wedding banquet when Christ returns, to eternally unite with his bride, the church, those who follow him here on earth. Will you drink this new wine that is on offer for everyone who is willing to have their shame covered and instead receive divine honour. Let us declare our faith in God. We believe in God the Father, from whom every family in heaven and on earth is named. We believe in God the Son, who lives in our hearts through faith and fills us with his love. We believe in God the Holy Spirit, who strengthens us with power from on high, we believe in one God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.
we pray for the coming of God's kingdom. You sent your son to bring good news to the poor, sight to the blind, freedom to the captives, and salvation to your people. Anoint us with your spirit, rouse us to work in his name. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to bring help to the poor and freedom to the oppressed. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to tell the world the good news of your healing love. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to those who mourn to bring joy and gladness instead of grief. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Send us to proclaim that the time is here for you to save your people. Father, by your spirit, bring in your kingdom. Father, use us, unworthy as we are, to bring in your kingdom of mercy, justice, love and peace. Empower us by your spirit and unite us in your son, that all our joy and delight may be to serve you now and forever. Amen. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Christ, the Son of God, perfect in you the image of his glory and gladden your hearts with the good news of his kingdom and the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit be with you now and forever. Amen.